you ever wonder where the term honeymoon comes from? I'm about to tell you. See, in the Middle Ages, when a young couple got married, their family would give them a moon or a month's worth of honey mead. And then the young couple would go off, frolic, and make merry for a few weeks, and hopefully come back with a bun in the oven. So that's what we're making today. N not a baby. Mead. So whether you're a Saxon warrior positioned in your shield wall, or a marauding Norse Viking, get ready for that sweet, sweet taste of alcoholic honey, mead. This time on Tasting History. So a bunch of people have been asking me to make merch, or merchandise. Uh, so there is some that I just got up in the uh, bar beneath this video, uh, but you know what? I would love some ideas about what kind of stuff you guys want, what I should have made, um, because I'm not very good at that kind of stuff. Anyway, merch below. More to come. So today's recipe comes from the 13th century Tractus manuscript, Folio 20R. Catchy title. Now usually I read the full recipe, but this recipe is rather long and rather wordy, so I'm just going to give you the hits, but I am going to put the full translation in the description if you care to read the entire thing. For to make mead, take one gallon of fine honey, and to that four gallons of water, and heat that water till it be as lang. Then dissolve the honey in the water. Then set them over the fire, and let them boil, and ever scum it as long as any filth riseth thereon. And then take it down off the fire, and let it cool in another vessel, till it be as cold as milk, when it cometh from the cow. Then take dregs of the finest ale, or else barm, and cast it into the water and the honey, and stir all well together. And so let it stand three days and nights. Then draw it from the dregs as clear as thou may into another vessel clean, and let it stand one night or two, and then draw it into another vessel, and serve it forth. So anyone who makes mead on the regular today is probably thinking, oh, that just doesn't really sound right to me. Because mead usually ferments for weeks, not days, and then ages for months, not a couple nights. Um, so this is a quick, quick mead. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, probably they would have let it age uh, longer if need be. I don't know. Uh, this mead is probably going to be not as alcoholic, very sweet and cloudy but we shall see. Now the recipe also gives us instructions on how to make this mead eaglin by adding various herbs such as hyssop, betony, moonwort, heart's tongue, and white whorehound, just to name a few. Kind of sounds like the three weird sisters at the beginning of Macbeth. Woo! Now eaglin is a shortened version of the word mediglin, meaning healing mead, because in medieval recipes, usually when there were herbs added, it was medicinal, uh, because that was the medicine that was most commonly available. And even today, any, any mead that is made with herbs and spices is called a mythiglin, very similar to mediglin. There are actually dozens of terms for all different kinds of mead depending on what you're adding into it and, and how alcoholic or how much honey is in it. There are tons. Um, and I'm not going to go into them all right now, but there are some great resources, uh, books, in the video description if you really want to kind of get into to mead and how to, to make all the different various forms. But for today, we're sticking with the traditional three ingredients. Water, don't use distilled water for this. Mineral or spring water, that's the way to go. Honey, and ale dregs or dried ale yeast. So the recipe calls for four gallons of water and one gallon of honey, but that's a lot. So I am going to be making uh, one gallon of water and a quart of honey. And really, as long as you stay with the four to one ratio, you're gonna be good to go. Now, as for the yeast, if you can get uh, ale balm or, or dregs, fantastic. But if not, you can go ahead and use dry yeast. The thing is, in either case, and eh, tell you how much to use. And it's really going to depend on how active the yeast is. So you're kind of just guessing. Um, what I ended up doing was about two tablespoons of, uh, of barm, and then I put it into a little bit of water with a drop of honey just to make sure that it was, was active, and, and it was. Um, if you're using dried yeast, it's hard to say. Usually for a gallon, you would use like a pinch, but because we're only doing this for three days, fermenting it for three days, I'd use a little bit more, maybe like a third of a packet, maybe. 
So first, if you're worried about bacteria, you can go ahead and sterilize all of the tools that we're going to be using. Though in the 13th century, they wouldn't have really cared, um, though they actually kind of have a way around that. So we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, but it can't hurt to, to sterilize your equipment. So what you'll need is a large pot for boiling, a large container for fermenting, another container for aging for all of two nights, and preferably like a bottle with a small opening so you can fit a bubbler or airlock. That lets the carbonation out without other things getting in. And then you can also probably use a siphon or a funnel depending on how you plan on getting the mead from one container to the next. A uh, siphon or a funnel will definitely make things easier. So following the recipe, we heat our water until it is lang. Now, I could not find anywhere a translation, Middle English, Old English, anything for the word lang. So if anyone knows, great. Otherwise, it really probably just means rather hot because what you want to be doing is to dissolve the honey in there so it's not just falling to the bottom. So add the honey and give it a mix until it's dissolved. Then boil the honey and water mixture called must. Now a lot of modern mead makers would not boil it at this point, but I think that that's, that's part of the way that they got rid of the bacteria that might have been in the water uh, in the Middle Ages. If you boil it, it'll get rid of most of the bacteria. Also, this thing is going to have alcohol and a ton of honey in it, so there's not going to be a lot left alive no matter what, so you're probably pretty safe. As it boils, skim off any scum that forms at the top. Though you really shouldn't have that much scum unless you're using honey directly from honeycomb uh, because that can have dirt or, or pieces of wax in it, and that's really what's going to be bubbling up to the top. Once boiled, take it off the fire and pour it into the second vessel, hopefully doing a better job than I did because I spilled a bunch and it got really, really sticky for like days afterward. I just, I couldn't get it to be non-sticky. Then you gotta let that honey and water mixture cool until it is the temperature of milk when it comes out of a cow, about 98 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius. If you put yeast in there before it gets ab about to that, it could kill the yeast. So just wait, it can take a while, but just wait. Then pour in your dregs or barm or yeast, then cover the top, not airtight, and leave it be out of direct sunlight. You could even put it like in a closet. Now by the next day, the mead should be in what I call the Don Ho phase of mead making because you'll see tiny bubbles starting to rise to the top. <laughs> oh, sometimes I hate myself <laughs> for those kinds of jokes. But I don't care. It makes me laugh. Now, if you were leaving it for longer than three days, it would actually start to get clear in this beautiful golden colored mead that we know and love so well. But in three days, that ain't gonna happen. So after three days, go ahead and transfer it, trying not to get too much of the yeast at the bottom to that next container or bottle. Then stick a bubbler in it and let it sit for a couple more nights. Now I'm actually making two little bottles out of this gallon. Uh, one that I'm going to try, you know, in, in two nights, and then one that I'm gonna hold on to for maybe six months or so. I wanna see how the flavor changes. It's not going to have any more fermentation time from that fer first fermenting, but the aging hopefully might mellow out the flavor. Um, I don't know, we'll see. So what inspired me to make mead today was actually because of a video game that's coming out today, or the day that this video will air, called Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Not associated with them in any way, but I'm still super excited because it's like a history-based game of like my favorite time period, Saxons and Vikings, you know, fighting it out. So I'm assuming that there's gonna be mead in there somewhere. Though when you think of, you know, Saxons and Vikings, yes, you think of mead, but mead actually got its start way before that. The earliest evidence for mead making actually comes from pottery found in northern China dating from about 7000 BC. There was residue from honey and the compounds associated with fermentation. And there are mentions of alcoholic drinks made with honey throughout Chinese literature, including the Song of Mead by Su Shi in the 11th century. In Central Europe, similar residues have been found in the pottery of the Bell Beaker culture, which roamed Bronze Age Europe more than 4,000 years ago. But the earliest written mention of mead actually comes from the ancient Indian Rig Veda, which says, I have tasted the sweet drink of life, knowing that it inspires good thoughts and joyous expansiveness to the extreme, that all the gods and all mortals seek it together, calling it mead. 
I praise indeed for this our mead. Now the drink that they're talking about in the Rig Veda is actually uh, known as Soma, which is a honey drink that probably also had some hallucinogens or something in it because it would give visions of the gods. Um, so hopefully not what I'm making today. And while this is the first mention that we have of mead being associated with the gods, it is far from the last. The Minoan culture produced mead and credited it to their mother goddess, Potnia, whose priestesses were named Melissa, meaning bee. The love that the Minoans had for this drink passed on to the other Greek civilizations. They also used these same Melissae as priestesses for Artemis and Demeter, and the drink eventually made its way to the Roman Empire. Columella gives us a recipe in Dere Rustica, as does Pliny the Elder in Naturalis Historia. There is a wine also made solely of honey and water. For this purpose, it is recommended that rain water should be kept for a period of five years. This beverage is known as hydromeli, and with age acquires the flavor of wine. It is nowhere more highly esteemed than in Phrygia. Now aren't you glad I said to use spring water rather than make you go get rain water and wait five years? You're welcome. Now after the fall of Rome, our mead journey takes us north to Britannia, or Britain. In one Welsh poem from around 550 AD called Cany y Med, we hear of that iconic drinking vessel for mead, the mead horn. <laughs> May Maelgun of Mona be affected with mead, and affect us from the foaming mead horns with the choicest pure liquor, which the bees collect and do not enjoy. Mead distilled sparkling, its praise is everywhere. So the mead in that poem is sparkling, which is interesting, uh, because based on what I've seen with our mead, ours is also going to be sparkling. In another Welsh poem, Y Gydodin, we hear the story of a battle where those fighting were rather hung over from too much mead. Men went to Catraith at morning, their high spirits lessened their lifespan. They drank mead, gold and sweet, and snaring. For a year the minstrels were merry. Their high spirits lessened their lifespan. How Welsh. Anyway, I wanted to actually thank a Welshman, the Welsh Viking here on YouTube, uh, named Jim, uh, for helping me with a bunch of the research and the pronunciation, as well as letting me know that the Welsh word for drunk is methui, which literally means meaded. I love that. Now, at about the same time that these Welshmen were lessening their lifespan with mead, the Irish were drinking it too, just across the water, on the hill of Tara, where the banquet hall was known as Czech Mithorda, the mead circling house. Which I can only imagine is rather similar to Hrothgar's mead hall, Hjorot in Beowulf, where Grendel would rip apart drunken Danes. They would willingly wait on their wassailing benches, a grapple with Grendel with grimmest of edges. Then this mead hall at morning with murder was reeking, the building was bloody at breaking of daylight. The bench deals all flooded, dripping, and bloodied. Now let us pause right there while I beseech thee, if you have never read Beowulf, or if you only read it under dress in high school or college, go get a copy because it is so great. And it's super quick to read. It's, it's not very long. I'm going to put my favorite uh, translation in the description, but really any translation works. Don't watch the movie, uh, but it, it's fantastic. And whoever wrote it, we don't know, but whoever wrote it really was the greatest of, of poets or skalds um, and must have gotten that from Odin because Odin made good skalds. And that brings us to Norse mythology. Following a war between two factions of the Norse gods, they decided to call a truce in the same way that we do today by spitting into a giant cauldron. Well, out of this godly saliva rose a creature, a man, god, not really specific, named Kvasir, and he was all-knowing. He was the most brilliant poet and, and had all of the knowledge that there was to be had. Even the gods would ask him questions that they needed to know. Well, when Kvasir wasn't busy, he liked to go down to Midgard, where the humans lived, and pass on some of his knowledge. How kind of him. Well, one day he came across two dwarves named Fjallar and Galar, who said, Come on in, we'll make you some mead. And that's what they proceeded to do. They made him some mead. They slit him open with knives and drained his blood into three vats, then added honey to it to create mead. How dark. Um, but that mead supposedly gave some of his power if you drank it. So it was called the mead of poetry. 
But old Kvasir was, of course, missed by the gods, who were like, hey, dwarves, where's our smart guy? And the dwarves were like, oh no, you know what? He came over and he was so smart that he choked on his own knowledge and died. And they believed him. Well, these two jerk dwarves weren't done with their little killing spree because a little while later, they killed a, a couple, a husband and wife, who were giants. And the giant's son was like, no. Uh, so he came over and took the dwarves and set them on an island that was about to flood so they would die. But the dwarves were like, hey, if you don't kill us, you can have this, this mead of poetry that we've got. And the, the giant was like, okay, and let them go. And now their part of the story is completely done. It's kind of weird. Um, but the giant didn't drink the mead himself. He actually just kind of hoarded it and gave it to somebody else to protect. And when Odin, played by Anthony Hopkins, found out, he decided, I need this mead of poetry, because Odin prided himself on his love of knowledge and poetry. Anyway, after a bunch of scheming and shape-shifting, Odin was allowed to have three sips, one from each vat of the mead. But joke's on them because an Odin sip is like the sip that I'm gonna take if you offer me a drink of your cocktail. He drained it dry, all three vats in three little sips, or huge sips, I guess. Then he turned into an eagle and with the Steve Miller band playing behind him, flew home to Asgard and regurgitated the mead into his own three containers. But he dropped a few drops down to Midgard where the humans live. And those drops are said to be the, the beginning of all mediocre poetry in the world. Because to be a great poet or skald, you have to get your mead directly from Odin himself. And I'm pretty sure that whoever wrote Beowulf got their mead directly from Odin himself. Now the mead that I'm making today, I'm not going to guess is going to make me into a great poet, but Maybe if you drink enough of it and you kind of get a little chatty, you'll think you're a great poet, because that has definitely happened to me in the past with mead. Anyway, let's give it a shot. So once two nights have passed, pour the mead into that final clean vessel, and it's ready to drink. Oh, oh dear. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Well, that was embarrassing. My uh, ale, ale horn seems to be leaking. That's not good. Nobody likes a leaky ale horn. So instead, I'm using a beer mug, and that's okay. Uh, so let's go ahead and try this mead. It smells very yeasty, still, which I guess is to be expected. Hmm, I like it. You know what, it's not as, when I poured it, it was effervescent, but when you drink it, you don't really get it. it it's pretty flat. Um, There's definitely some alcohol in there, though I don't know how much, because I didn't, um, you can find out. There are ways you can test it and everything. I didn't do it. Um, definitely alcoholic, though, and definitely super sweet. I think it would mellow if I gave it some more time, which I'm going to do. Obviously not fermenting, but I am going to leave it in that second bottle, maybe six months. Maybe in six months we do another episode on something else, um, and I drink the rest of the mead, uh, and we see how it goes. Anyway. Go make yourself some mead. It's actually not that hard. Just take some time um, and enjoy life and enjoy poetry. And I will see you next time on Tasting History.